Protocols are the set of rules that is followed by every device that wants to communicate on the network. There are a lot of protocols, but today we'll only be focusing on those that are in the CompTIA exams. If you see this camera icon on your screen, please take a screenshot, it will serve you as a note or the summary. Now, rather than discussing each protocol individually, I've classified the protocols based on the similar rules they have. So let's start from the protocols that help with our internet browsing mm -hmm. system. This is a web page. A collection of multiple web pages makes a website. And the system that connects all these web pages together is called the World Wide Web. And HTTP is what allows us to fetch specific web pages from the World Wide Web. When you try to visit some website, you'll see HTTP is added to the front, which indicates you are indeed using this protocol to visit that website. It is great, however, it has no security mechanism, so everything between you and the web server is exposed. Which means anyone snooping in the middle can see your private information such as bank details, credit card numbers, etc. But not to worry, to stop such attacks, nowadays HTTP yes is used. So when you visit a website, you are most likely going to see HTTP yes at the front. These messages are shown when you visit a website with the HTTP and HTTP yes. HTTP secure is just a secure version of HTTP. And when using this protocol, the web content is in the encrypted form, which means anyone snooping in the middle will not understand anything. Only the client, the CU, and the web server has a key to decrypt this message. So only these two parties can read the content. And HTTPS uses a transportless security or TLS to share this encryption key. All security features offered by the HTTPS is through the use of TLS protocol. TLS may sound complicated, but what it actually does is it verifies the identity of both client and the server, which is called as authentication. Second, it also helps us secretly share the cipher key, which is used for the encryption. And third, it also verifies the message integrity, which is done through the hash value. There is a similar protocol called SSL or Secure Socket Layer, which is an older technology that got replaced by the TLS. It isn't on the CompTIA exams, but you will hear this term out there. Just remember, we don't teach SSL, TLS is a way to go. But still, I won't explain everything about the TLS because there is a lot to cover. For the exams, just remember, TLS uses a X.509 certificate and it uses asymmetric encryption for the authentication and exchange of symmetric key. This key is used by both parties for encrypting and decrypting of the data. And to fetch the website using either HTTP or HTTPS, pieces should know what is the IP address of that website. IP address is an identifier for the devices on the network. It is just a way to tell apart the devices. And it is not possible to remember IP address of all the websites on the internet. So we use a DNS server that can resolve the IP address when we query them with a the host name. Now to request the DNS server, we use a DNS protocol, which in the simplest term, gives out an IP address when queries with the website host name. The DNS query is done by the browser automatically whenever we try to visit a website. So to summarize, whenever we try to visit the website, the browser first performs a DNS query to find out the IP address of the website. DNS query is done by using DNS protocol. After the IP address is known, HTTP is used to request for the desired content. It is unsecure, so we use a secure version known as HTTPS, which uses a transport layer security. The goal of TLS is to authenticate and exchange the key. These are the necessary information for the exams. Take a screenshot. Let's move on to file transfer protocols. Not only just web pages, if we have a file server setup, we can use a FTP protocol to fetch files from that server. And not only just file retrieval, FTP allows accessing, managing, and modifying directories as well. However, before accessing the content, user must authenticate to the FTP server first. And FTP in itself doesn't provide much for the security except the authentication. The data transmission still takes place in a clear text. So anyone snooping in the middle can see what you are downloading. So for better security, there is a secure FTP protocol known as SFTP, which uses the SSS protocol to encrypt the transmission, making it secure. We will look into the SSH later on in this video. Similarly, you will also see FTPS protocol, which is similar to SFTP. However, it uses the SSL TLS to encrypt the data transmission. And there is another protocol called the Triple FTP, which is the simplest form of FTP. 
it has no security whatsoever. Just ask for the file and FTP server will respond in the clear text. Due to its unsafe nature, TFTP is often used inside the local network. In Grub Bootloader, there is an option for PXE boot, which means if your PC doesn't have an operating system in it, you can still boot it directly from the TFTP server. Linux will request a TFTP server for the boot files and TFTP will respond back. Since TFTP doesn't provide any security, it is not recommended to use over the internet. Moving to the email protocols, let's understand how our email is transferred first. For the email communication, each side has the mail client and the mail server. Mail client is an application which is installed on the client device. You've probably seen this application, Gmail, Thunderbird, Outlook, etc. The working is quite simple. The client sends an email message to the mail server. The mail server checks the destination email, forms the necessary DNS resolution to find the destination mail server address. After finding the address, the email is forwarded there and finally the receiver can fetch emails from that server. Now let's see how our protocols play their role in the whole process. The simplest one is SMTP which stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. It is used to send an email between client server and also between the server itself. In short, SMTP just sends an email. Once an email is sent to the destination server, receiver can either use an POP3 or IMAP protocol to download the emails. Both protocols download the email from the mail server to the mail client. However, the core difference is, when POP3 is used to download all the emails, the copy on the server is also removed. Which means in the environment where the same email server is used by the multiple users or multiple clients, the first person accesses it and since the emails are deleted from the server, other person when tries to access the email later on, they will not see it. Emails are only stored on the client's device. IMAP on the other hand leaves a copy of the emails on the server itself. And the thing is, it synchronizes the emails between the mail server and the mail client. Synchronizing means, whatever the user does on the client, it also performs on the server too. The action taken on the emails such as read, delete, move are mirrored between the client and the server keeping both in sync and allowing multiple devices to access the same mailbox seamlessly. I should probably mention a webmail too, as it is what most people use these days. When you access your emails through the browser, that's a webmail. Webmails eliminates the need to retrieve emails from the server, as the content of the emails are displayed directly in the web browser. Thus, IMAP and POP protocol are not used by us directly. We are just using service provider's interface to interact with the emails. Remember, we are not directly using the protocols, but the service provider may still use them to access the emails. Now rather than fetching some content from the server, what if we need to perform some task on the server itself? To do so, we need to access it. And with cloud computing in huge trend nowadays, having a physical access to the server is not always possible. So in such case, we need to access it remotely through remote sessions. Remote session is like controlling a device from another place, usually over the internet. We use protocols such as Telnet, SSH, RDP to remotely control the device from any place. Telnet is one of the oldest which provides the virtual terminal that a user can interact with. Once a Telnet session is established, a user can provide commands to perform almost any task that can be done through command line interface. You can establish a Telnet session by typing Telnet providing the remote IP and the port number that you want to connect to. And if the port is active, the session will be established. But Telnet offers no security whatsoever. That's why professional use it just to check if the port on the remote host is active or not. To maintain a secure remote session, we use a secure cell or SSH protocol. SSH creates a secure tunnel using robust encryption to protect data transmission from potential attackers. The concept of tunnel may sound daunting but it just means only the sender and the receiver are able to see the information flowing through it. Along with the better security, SSS does everything that a telnet can do, so it is a better option to maintain a remote session. Both telnet and SSS need a server that need to be running on the machine that you want to connect to. It can be installed using this command respectively. Finally, on the list is Remote Dexter Protocol, which is a proprietary protocol developed by the Microsoft. 
where the telnet and SSS provides a CLI to interact with the remote host. RDP on the other hand provides a graphical user interface to perform the tasks. Having a GUI is a great option, so Windows and even Mac comes pre-built with the own version of RDP client, which makes providing remote support easier. So far, all we have done is sent or fetch some content over the internet. But we often enjoy other things as well, such as watching a video, making a phone calls over the internet. These audio and video are the multimedia components, and we utilize various multimedia protocols to get our job done. For the exams, there isn't a lot to know about this group of protocols, so I'll explain it in brief. First two on the list are SIP and H.3.3, which are signaling protocols. Signaling protocols is used to set up, manage, and terminate sessions between the endpoint. In easy words, they work as the negotiators, making sure everyone agrees on how the conversation will happen before it starts. They define things such as message format, type of encoding, and other parameters that will be used throughout the communication. SIP is used for the voice session, and S.323 is used for the video session. However, due to many issues in S.323, it is often replaced by SIP and WebRTC, which is a new technology with much better features. Now, after a session is established, actual voice and video packets are transmitted with the help of real-time transfer protocol. It is commonly used to watch videos, video conference, and other real-time communication system. RTP is often used alongside with RTCP and RTSP because of this improved control over the multimedia playback. And last one on the list is Media Gateway Control Protocol or MGCP, which is kinda similar to SIP protocol, but it was mostly used in telephone-enabled cable modems. If you order a voice line with a Comcast service, the box you plugged your phone into spoke MGCP to the Comcast servers. But it is really seen these days, so it is not that important. And finally, we have come with the management protocols. If you have watched this video, you know each device on the network has an IP address. And assigning IP address manually is a slow process. So a DHCP server is placed, which will automatically provide an IP address to the new devices on the network. And DSCP server uses a DSCP protocol to give out IP with other network information. In a network, there could be many other devices such as printers or NAS server. Such devices are often used by all users on the network. And to save these devices, we can use the SMB protocol, which stands for Server Message Block. SMB is a network file sharing protocol, which means you can share files, printers, or any other resources. However, it is often used inside a private network since the older version of SMB were really unsecure. Suppose a user is watching a live football event and another user wants to watch the same live broadcast as well. The router maintains a multicast group membership table that records which devices are part of which multicast group. A new device can send out an ICMP message to the local router to let the router know it wants to receive the update too. And now a packet is forwarded to the second PC as well. In short, IGMP protocol is used to manage the IP multicast session by tracking group membership as well as active multicast sessions. So far, we frequently talk about sharing resources on the LAN. And in the complex network, there are a lot of devices and resources to manage. So admins often have a directory that keeps track of all these network resources. And to access it, lightweight directory access protocol or LDAP is used. Not just network resources, it can contain any information from user details to login credentials, LDAP is a protocol that is used to access the directory database. And one of the most widely used directory service is called Active Directory. AD is often used in enterprise network for identity and access management. You'll probably never use LDAP manually. It is utilized by the domain controller within the Active Directory. It is a vast topic to discuss, so just have this note for the exams. And the final one on the list is Network Time Protocol. And it only does one thing, gives out correct time. Most servers rely on accurate time to work properly. In such case, you can set up a NTP server and connect all of your server to that same NTP so that their clock are in sync with each other. Some protocols that we discussed have their secure counterpart as well, which we may not have discussed. They often use security features provided by the SSH or TLS. They are secure, reliable, and are the recommended choice to get the job done. It's an infographic to better understand them.
If you are still watching, I hope you learned something new. Now scroll down and hit that like and subscribe button. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next session.